So in lecture seven, we talked about um, the electronic band structure and we discussed uh, various ways to, various methods for calculating uh, band structures. And we also talked about effective masses and how they're related to k dot p band theory. So in this lecture and in the next one, what I would like to do is I would like to apply these band structures that we have calculated uh, in order to uh, discuss the optical interband transitions that can occur in these uh, materials. And we will calculate the absorption coefficients for direct and indirect band gaps using a Fermi's golden rule. Uh, we will um, introduce the Einstein coefficients, which are one way, uh, a very early way, uh, a method from early quantum mechanics to uh, describe these um, interband transitions. And we can extract uh, the band gaps with a Kautz plot, and then we will discuss not only the uh, lowest uh, interband transitions at the band gap, the direct or indirect band gap, but we will also talk about um, uh, absorption that can occur uh, higher uh, above the band gap, uh, these so-called Van Hoek singularities. So probably I will not be able to finish everything today in one hour, and therefore we'll just see how far we get, and then I will continue again in three weeks. Uh, again, the books, uh, Mark Fox is uh, more basic. You and Cardona has a lot of in-depth materials and for materials parameters, I will show you some examples from the Yofi Institute website. So here's the outline that I just mentioned. And if you remember the end of the last lecture, then at the end of the last lecture, we looked at uh, the span structures of different materials. So here on the left, we have gallium arsenide, which is a direct material where the initial and final state have the same wave vector. Therefore, the momentum change is zero. And here on the right, we have germanium as an example for an indirect material, where the lowest uh, transition would occur from the gamma minimum, from the gamma maximum of the valence band to the minimum of the uh, conduction band at the L point. So here you see if there is an electron hole pair excited across this indirect gap, then a delta K is not equal to zero. Sorry, I need to fix that. So for an indirect transition, the initial and final electron states have a different wave. So this is where we uh, stopped uh, at the last lecture, I believe. And um, this is another more schematic way of showing the same thing, that we can have a direct band gap, uh, where we have a direct transition between the valence band maximum and the conduction band minimum. But in order to uh, do an indirect transition, the photon has zero momentum. The photon has zero wave vector, at least on the scale of the uh, crystal. So a photon raises an electron uh, vertically. So the electron goes into this virtual state because there's nothing happening here. And at that point, a second process is necessary. For example, we can absorb or emit a lattice vibration, a phonon. So together with this direct transition and then the momentum change, this is a two-step process. And uh, with that, uh, we can do an indirect uh, transition. So indirect transitions require a phonon to conserve crystal momentum. Instead of a phonon, we can also have defects to help us uh, conserve momentum. Uh, we can have uh, such indirect transitions in an alloy or in a nanoparticle, but something needs to be there to conserve the crystal momentum or at least to justify why we can violate the conservation of crystal momentum. And um, what we always need to think, what we always need to consider is that crystal momentum is not the same as momentum. So if 
in this process, delta k is non-zero, but the change in the wave vector is equal to a reciprocal lattice vector, then that is called an uncoupled process. And um, the wave vector, the wave vector, the uh, crystal momentum is periodic, so uh, adding or subtracting a reciprocal lattice vector does not change the uh, momentum. So the other two uh, terms I want to explain are absorption and recombination. So if we have an incoming photon, we have an incoming photon and this photon creates an electron hole pair. So the incoming photon takes an electron from the ground state and lifts it into the excited state. So what we have now in the ground state is a missing electron and that missing electron that is called a hole. And then this electron that used to be here now sits in the excited state. So we have a pair consisting of an electron and a missing electron, or an electron and a hole. So that is an absorption process. At some time later, this excited electron will jump back down into the ground state and fill this hole. And that is done uh, with the emission of a photon. And this process is called uh, recombination. Uh, one question that you might ask is, do energy and crystal momentum have to be conserved? And the answer is, yes, of course, uh, energy and momentum have to be conserved. But we always live within the Eisenberg uncertainty. So the, in this context, the energy Heisenberg uncertainty rule is easier to understand. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that <coughs> delta E, which is the amount by which we violate energy conservation, delta E times delta T is equal to H bar. So that is the uncertainty principle for the energy. So what that means is that, yes, we are allowed to violate the energy conservation law, but only for a very short time. So if we have a process which is maybe 10 femtoseconds or 100 femtoseconds, then we're allowed to uh, violate the energy conservation law by a few milli EV or by up to an EV maybe. So yes, we can violate the uh, energy conservation law, but only for a short time. So, what about crystal momentum? In an infinite crystal, delta Q is equal to zero. So, in an infinite crystal, there is no uncertainty uh, with respect to the momentum. So, in an infinite crystal, we are required to conserve crystal momentum exactly. That's what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says. But, if we have a nanoparticle, then the finite size of that nanoparticle introduces an uncertainty delta Q. And therefore, in a nanoparticle, we can violate this uh, conservation law of crystal momentum. So these selection rules that delta K is equal to zero, uh, strictly speaking, is only true in, a, in an infinitely large crystal. But we will see uh, examples uh, later when we talk about confinement and when we talk about some of the physics of nanoparticles. In gallium arsenide, uh, so here this is just a schematic for any material in gallium arsenide, the uh, interband transitions are a little bit more complicated because we can, uh, there are three different bands in the uh, valence band and therefore we can have transitions from the heavy hole band, which is this one, from the light hole band, which is the number two, and from the split up hole. So all of these three types of transitions are possible. And uh, therefore, the uh, calculation of the absorption coefficient can be quite complicated, especially in this picture, everything is parabolic. But in reality, we have non-parabolicity. So the uh, production band or the valence bands are not exactly parabolic. <coughs> and then we also have 
a warping of the uh, hole bands, especially the heavy hole band is warped, and uh, that includes some other complications. So our goal now here in this lecture is to determine uh, how can we calculate the absorption cross-section for such interband transitions, and how do these <coughs> cross-sections depend on uh, the energy and on the wave vector, and what are the mathematical ways how we can describe absorption and emission. So I want to start with a very old topic, uh, which was developed by <coughs> Albert Einstein a little over a hundred years ago. Uh, there is a review article by Bob Hilborn in the American Journal of Physics, which is a little bit more recent. <coughs> And um, Einstein introduced uh, coefficients A and B. These are the Einstein coefficients uh, for the emission and absorption processes. So if I have a two-level system and I have an electron in the excited state, then at some point this electron in the excited state will emit a photon and uh, recombine with the hole in the ground state, so this electron will jump back from the will jump from the excited state back into the ground state, and the lifetime uh, tau for which this happens, uh, you know that uh, tau is the lifetime for this process. So you can think of this like a, a, a decay in nuclear physics, a decay of a nucleus, and the uh, inverse lifetime, the rate for this uh, recombination process, that is the first Einstein coefficient A, which is this uh, spontaneous emission process. We call this emission process spontaneous because there is no outside influence which forces this electron to jump uh, from the excited state back into the ground state. The electron just does this uh, voluntarily, uh, spontaneously, without any outside influence. And um, in this picture, you might say, well, what about Pauli exclusion principle? And what about fermions? And of course, Einstein did not know about these things in 1917. So that's why, uh, with today's knowledge, we need to wonder, well, is there even room for the electron here in the uh, ground state to jump back down? So there can be some blocking of transitions if uh, all these states here are filled. But we won't get into that right now. So that's the uh, first Einstein coefficient A and the emission. And here is the rate. The rate of these emission processes is equal to the Einstein coefficient multiplied by the number of electrons in the excited state. The second process is absorption. And um, if we have an incoming photon, then the uh, the incoming photon will take an electron from the ground state and lift it into the excited state. So this is an absorption process. Absorption is always stimulated because absorption cannot happen spontaneously, at least not at zero temperature. The electron cannot jump from the ground state into the excited state uh, without uh, an outside photon coming in to lift it. And uh, going back to what I said earlier, well, the, the electron can jump from the ground state into the excited state without a photon, but then it can live there only for a very, very short time, as described by the Einstein, by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But uh, for an extended period of time, in order for the electron to jump from the ground state into the excited state, we need to have uh, external energy, we need to have an external photon. And then the rate of transitions of electrons from the ground state to the excited state, that is given by this Einstein coefficient B e, multiplied by the number of electrons in the ground state multiplied by the energy density of the incident um, electromagnetic field, the incident light. So if these are the only two processes that are possible, and that was the thought at the time in 1917, then there is a paradox. Uh, 
because for sufficiently high light intensity, or if the light time is long, so for an efficient, for a sufficiently high light intensity, all the electrons will end up in the ground state. I'm sorry, all electrons will end up in the excited state. And that is, uh, um, that is an unphysical situation, and in order to fix this situation, Einstein introduced a third process. In addition to the absorption and the spontaneous emission, Einstein said there can be stimulated emission. So if I have an incident photon, then the incident photon cannot only lift an electron from the ground state into the excited state. This incident photon can also take an electron which is already in the excited state and move it back into the ground state. So that is stimulated emission. And um, the rate for this process to happen is, the, uh, is another Einstein coefficient phi. The indices are reversed compared to the absorption Einstein coefficient, but there is a relationship, and we will see this later. So the rate is equal to the Einstein coefficient times the number of electrons in the excited state multiplied by the energy density. Um, if we now have, if we are now in equilibrium, if this um, electromagnetic field has been on for a very long time, if this entire two-level system is uh, locked up in a black box with a certain temperature T, then uh, in equilibrium, the number of uh, electrons in the ground, in the excited state must be constant, and the number of electrons in the ground state must be uh, constant, and therefore the uh, rates for moving electrons up and moving electrons down, uh, these two rates have to be equal to each other in equilibrium. So that is this condition. Now, in thermal equilibrium, we also know that we can use uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics to describe the ratio of electrons in the excited state uh, over the number of electrons in the ground state. And that uh, ratio is simply given by Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics with this degeneracy factor. So, you know, if this level one is an S state, then the degeneracy would be two, but if the uh, excited state is a P state, then the degeneracy would be six. So depending on the degeneracies that can also affect the uh, ratio of the uh, populations um, as a function of temperature. So um, we, 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 uh, Maxwell Boltzmann statistics tells us about the number of electrons in the ground state and the excited state. And then we also know um, what Einstein did is he imagined that this two-level system was uh, locked up inside a black box and everything had temperature T. And therefore, the radiation inside this uh, black box is given by uh, black body radiation. Uh, which is given by uh, this energy spectrum here. And <clears throat> then if we let, not the time, but if we let the temperature go to infinity, then this term here becomes one. So if we let, uh, if we let the temperature go to infinity, then we get this relationship between the two Einstein B coefficients. And um, with some uh, additional manipulations, we can also calculate the uh, Einstein A coefficient from the Einstein B coefficient. And we see that the uh, spontaneous uh, emission rate goes like uh, omega cubed. So um, let's think about this uh, relationship here for a little bit and what that means. So uh, this equation describes the spontaneous emission rate to the stimulated emission rate. And we see that the spontaneous emission goes like omega cubed times the 
stimulated emission. So if you want to build a laser, then you really rely on stimulated emission, not on spontaneous emission. And therefore, building a UV laser is very, very difficult because spontaneous emission goes like the photon energy to the third power. So it is always much easier to uh, build an infrared laser than a, uh, than a UV laser. So lasing can occur uh, if the stimulated emission exceeds the absorption. That is the condition. So these are the three processes. We have absorption and spontaneous emission and stimulated emission. So the stimulated emission rate must be greater than the absorption rate. And we also know about uh, this condition between the two uh, Einstein B coefficients. And therefore, for lasing to occur, the population in the excited state must be greater than the population in the initial state multiplied by this ratio of the degeneracies. So in order to have a laser, we need to have population inversion. Um, we need to have more electrons in the excited state than we can have them in the ground state. And that, of course, is not possible in a two-level system. For that, we need a three-level system. But I don't want to talk a lot more about uh, lasers here at the moment. Uh, I do want to show you two typical pictures. So a laser will always have uh, two mirrors. There is a total reflecting mirror on one end and a partially transmitting mirror, or also called output coupler, on the other end. And in the middle, we have this gain medium, which has you know, uh, two or more, usually three or more, um, energy levels. And then we somehow need to excite, we need to add energy to this optical medium in order to create population inversion. And in this example, uh, that is done by applying an electric field. So this might be a semiconductor laser where the population inversion is created by an electric field. And in the example down here, we have an external light source. And so this optical medium here is uh, optically pumped by this external light source. And again, we have a 100% uh, a high reflecting mirror on one end and a partially reflecting mirror on the other end and uh, that is called the output coupler and um, you see that this uh, uh, mirror here is, is curved on one side in order to keep the light focused inside the um, optical medium and this is the um, emitted light wave from the laser. So the Einstein coefficients are one method to describe uh, absorption and emission. And um, because of the relationship between the Einstein coefficients, it is sufficient to calculate one of them. And then we get, we're getting the other two uh, from these two very simple equations. So how can we calculate uh, how can we calculate um, the Einstein coefficients? And uh, perhaps we should also ask, which Einstein coefficients do we want to calculate? And the Einstein coefficients that we want to calculate is this one here, which describes the cross-section of the absorption. So the, we have an incident photon, and the incident photon raises an electron from the ground state to the excited state. That's the B2, B12 uh, coefficient, and that is the one that we will calculate. And uh, how do we calculate? We calculate that using a Fermi's golden rule. So this is the Hamiltonian for the um, incoming photon, and the incoming photon raises an electron from the initial state into the final state. So that's the uh, matrix elements that we need to calculate. 
and we need to integrate over all possible initial and final states and we need to make sure that um, we need to make sure that the energy is conserved. And uh, in this calculation, we're only talking about an atom or a molecule. We're not talking about a crystal yet. In a crystal, of course, we would need a similar delta function for the uh, conservation of crystal momentum. Uh, but we will get back to that later. So in order to calculate this transition rate using Fermi's golden rule, what we typically assume is that this matrix element is constant. So every initial and every final state has the same uh, matrix element. And then if we make this assumption about the constant matrix element, we simply take this matrix element, we move it outside of the integral because it is constant, and then what we're left with is this integral over the delta function, and that we call the joint density of states, which takes into account the uh, structure of the initial and uh, final states. So uh, what we will do first is first we will talk about this matrix element, and then we will talk about the joint density of states. So, what is this interaction Hamiltonian that describes the interaction between the electron and the um, incoming um, electromagnetic wave and the way that this, elect this is described and I remind you about uh, quantum mechanics so in quantum mechanics we have this uh, momentum operator and if we introduce the electromagnetic field then we need to replace the momentum operator with P minus QA, where A is the vector potential of the electromagnetic field. And um, we use first order perturbation theory. We assume that the electromagnetic field is weak, and therefore we only keep linear terms in the vector potential. And the vector potential um, is not uniquely defined. There are several ways how we can define this, and we choose the Coulomb gauge. And in the Coulomb gauge, the divergence of the vector potential is equal to zero. And we also use a long wavelength limit where the wavelength is much larger than the uh, dimensions of the, of the molecule or the wavelength is much larger than the uh, unit cell. And because we make this approximation, this exponential here, you know, the, uh, obviously the, the vector potential for a photon that will be a plane wave, uh, if we go back to like lectures two or three, uh, then, so this A is a plane wave, and because we work in the long wavelength limit, we don't really have to worry about this complex exponential because this K is so small, because the wavelength is so large, that uh, within the system that we describe, uh, this exponential we can set that equal to 1. So we only keep the zeroth order uh, term in the Taylor expansion of this complex exponential. So the interaction Hamiltonian with this replacement of the momentum operator in the Schrodinger equation, the uh, perturbation operator is equal to P dot A. But because we're working in this uh, limit here, we can reduce that to a zero, the uh, the, the amplitude, the, the, the vectorial amplitude of the vector potential. So now the interaction uh, matrix element becomes this ratio of E over M multiplied by F dot P, because that's the interaction Hamiltonian, F P I, this matrix element, uh, multiplied by the um, amplitude of the vector potential. And this matrix element, we already talked about this last week, because that is the k dot p matrix element p. So we know this matrix element exactly 
by calculating, uh, by measuring the effective masses in semiconductors. And so we know that this matrix element P is like around 20 electron volts in the proper units for most semiconductor materials. So how can we calculate this uh, matrix element? How can we uh, describe that more? And why is this momentum matrix element usually called the electric dipole? So where is the dipole here? So in order to look at this, we note that the momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity, but the velocity is equal to the derivative of the position. In quantum mechanics, the derivative of an operator is equal to the commutator of that operator with the Hamiltonian. So the derivative, the velocity can be replaced by the commutator of the position with the Hamiltonian times some uh, factors. So the momentum matrix element is equal to the matrix element for this commutator. Now here, this is the Hamiltonian of the unperturbed system, which is acting on the initial wave function. And uh, so this Hamiltonian acting on that wave function, that is equal to the initial energy. And similarly here, we uh, let this Hamiltonian act to the left on the final state, and that gives us a factor EF. Remember that the energy is a real number, so we don't have to worry about the complex conjugation. So um, we can pull this difference EF minus EI. We can pull that outside of the uh, matrix element because these are just constants. And EF minus EI, that is EFI, the difference between the final and the initial energies. And then we cancel the H bar omega, so uh, we cancel the H bar. Uh, so this becomes I times the uh, difference in the angular frequencies between <coughs> the final state and the initial state multiplied by this um, matrix element where we have put the E inside the matrix element. So ER, that really looks like a dipole now. And therefore, this matrix element is called the electric dipole matrix element. And these <coughs> types these types of optical transitions are called electric dipole transitions. So the momentum matrix element is really the same as the dipole matrix element in integral, the, mat the uh, matrix element for a <coughs> momentum operator is the same as for the uh, position operator, which is kind of surprising, but it comes from the fact that the derivative of, the, uh, of an operator is equal to the commutator with the Hamiltonian. So we can look at uh, several selection rules and this is sort of a pedestrian's way of looking at uh, group theory. Uh, we don't need much group theory in order to understand these selection rules, but much more complicated selection rules can be applied if we use group theory. <coughs> so the first thing we note is that the operator here for which we calculate the matrix element, the parity of this operator is odd. And therefore, the parity of the initial state must be different from the parity of the final state. Otherwise, the matrix element would be zero. Second, we note that this operator R here, that belongs to the representation for uh, the L equals one uh, operator. So this, this R here corresponds to a uh, uh, delta L equals 1, and therefore the angular momentum between these two states must differ by uh, plus or minus 1. And that argument is only true if we have spherical symmetry. This argument is not true if we have a crystal. We need to think about crystal field splittings and how they change the uh, selection rules for the um, angular momentum conservation in uh, the lowered 
just the symmetry. Uh, the magnetic quantum number m, uh, how does that change? So first we note that the, the natural eigenstates of a photon are not linearly polarized light. Uh, a circular polarized light has a uh, angular, has a magnetic quantum number plus one and uh, left, so right circularly polarized light belongs to a magnetic quantum number one, plus one and uh, left circularly polarized light uh, uh, causes a transition where the magnetic quantum number ch changes by minus one. So if you really want to look at changes in the magnetic quantum number, then we need to do experiments with uh, circularly polarized light. Uh, with linearly polarized light, um, we can have any change, zero, plus, or minus one, in the magnetic quantum number. And, uh, but which change we will see depends on uh, the uh, direction of the polarization. Uh, we also should talk about how the spin changes in such an optical transition. And first, you see that there is no spin operator here. This vector r is the position operator that does not act on the spin, and therefore, during such an electric dipole transition, uh, the spin does not change, and therefore, of course, the spin component also does not change. So these electric dipole transitions, uh, they do conserve the spin, they do not flip the spin, uh, if we want to flip the spin, then we need to do something to uh, break the symmetry. For example, we can have an external magnetic field, or we can look at uh, other more exotic uh, types of transitions. So these selection rules are valid only in spherical symmetry for a single atom or photon. And then we need to consider how the lowered crystal symmetry uh, uh, changes these selection rules, and for that we need the uh, theory of the point group uh, representation. So, in this slide, we looked at the matrix element for an isolated atom. How does this change if we have, uh, if we are in a solid? So the, uh, this is our matrix element. It reduces down to the uh, momentum uh, operator multiplied by the vector potential. And we use the same scheme uh, with the commutator that we've done before to take this energy difference out of that uh, matrix element. And that gives us the electric dipole. And then over here, we have the uh, vector potential, um, but the electric field is equal to the derivative of the vector potential. And if we write the vector potential as a plane wave, then the time derivative gives us this factor i omega. So this omega a, that becomes equal to the electric field. So that's how we get rid of the uh, vector potential and the um, energy difference. And we, also, we only look at the electric field. So the difference between an isolated atom and a crystal is that in a crystal we have Bloch's theorem. And therefore, we write the initial and uh, final wave functions as a product of a plane wave term multiplied by something which is periodic uh, in the crystal and is the same in every unit cell. So now, uh, this matrix element, this is an integral where we have, where we integrate over the, these functions, these periodic functions, uf and ui, and also in that integral we have these complex exponentials. And um, if we integrate over some function times complex exponentials or plane wave terms, then we will have constructive interference unless the uh, 
wave vector inside that complex exponential is equal to zero. So this matrix element here must be zero unless the final and initial states are equal to each other. So instead of taking the matrix element over the complete wave function, we only need to integrate over the periodic parts and we're getting this delta function and of course we need to multiply with the electric field of the wave. So this is the mathematical derivation for why uh, the optical interband transitions must be direct and why the um, crystal momentum must be conserved. And if we want to make such indirect transitions, then we need another particle like a phonon or a surface or a defect or a finite particle size or alloying. Something else needs to carry away the crystal momentum. And therefore, uh, indirect transitions are some sort of a product between this electric dipole matrix element times some other matrix element which describes the interaction with the other particle. And therefore, the, um, and therefore these, inter these indirect transitions are uh, second order processes because they have two matrix elements that must be included. So, so far we've talked about this matrix element so now uh, we want to talk about the joint density of states. So Fermi's golden rule says we need to integrate over all initial and final states, the matrix elements and the delta function. We uh, assume that the uh, matrix element is constant. We take the matrix element out of this uh, integral and we only integrate over that delta function and that is the joint density of states. The joint density of states is equal to all of these, uh, is, is, is the integral over all initial and final states. Um, in a crystal, we label the electronic states with a band index n and with a wave vector k. And therefore, this integral is an integral in k space. And since we only, since this integral here only depends on energy, we somehow want to reduce this uh, <coughs> integral in three-dimensional k space. We want to reduce that to an integral in energy space. And in order to do that, we break up this uh, volume integral in k space into an integral over uh, spheres with constant energy, constant energy surfaces. So we need to take the, uh, the, the volume, I'm sorry, the uh, surface of a sphere with constant energy is equal to 4 pi k squared, where k is the radius, and this uh, 1 over 8 pi cubed, that is the factor that I talked about earlier when we talked about fluid transforms. Uh, that's where this factor comes from. So in order to do a three-dimensional integration, we can only integrate over k, and then uh, this is the uh, sphere, this is the um, surface area of a sphere with constant energy. So we've reduced this to a one-dimensional integral over k but we'd like to get a one-dimensional integral over energy, so we note that uh, within the effective mass approximation, the energy is equal to uh, something that goes like k squared, so I take the derivative of this. So here now I have an expression which relates the a change in energy to a change in momentum, so I just solve this delta k and I plug this delta k here into the integral and then I am getting a, uh, an expression uh, for delta e. So the answer here is that the joint density of states is this integral uh, from zero to infinity over all energies uh, over dE and then there are some uh, prefactors and then there is this square root of energy term, which comes from the fact that you know, here I have a delta k, so uh, 
k is equal to square root of energy. That's where this term comes from, times the delta function. And of course, this integral I can solve uh, because now this uh, energy EFI must be equal to h bar omega. So um, I can use this and plug it in here. So the uh, joint density of states is equal to some prefactors which have to do with the uh, with the optical mass that I'll talk about in a second, times a square root of h bar omega minus the uh, difference between the bands. So that's the joint density of states. And uh, these transitions can only happen if the photon energy is larger than the energy gap. Uh, the joint density of states would be zero if the uh, photon energy is too small to uh, stimulate any optical transitions. So which mass do we need to use here? Uh, this mass comes from the difference between the initial and final uh, bands. <clears throat> So the conduction band mass is, I'm sorry, the conduction band energy is equal to the band gap times this effective mass term, which has the electron mass. The heavy hole energy is equal to minus, because the curvature is negative, and the uh, free particle term, but now with the uh, heavy hole mass. And the same for the light hole energy, it's the same. But now I have, I'm sorry, this is another type of this should say uh, light hole mass. And then finally, the um, split off energy is the, the energy of the split off band is minus delta zero, and also this should say minus h bar squared k squared over uh, two times the effective mass. So I will fix these slides before I upload them. So the Photon energy is equal to the difference between the final state energy minus the initial state energy. So that's the difference between the conduction band energy and the uh, valence band energy of the whole. And if we take that difference, for example, through a combination from the uh, electron mass and uh, electron band and the heavy hole bands, then this, will, this minus sign, because there's a minus sign here, these two minus signs will actually cancel, and they will give us a plus sign. So if I take this difference, then I'm getting something where there is this mass in the denominator, but this mass is really a reduced mass. So the optical mass that I need to plug into the density of states, the optical mass, that is a reduced mass, which is the uh, 1 over the reduced mass is 1 over the final state mass plus 1 over the initial state mass. So that is the optical mass uh, that I need to use. So now we know everything uh, in order to calculate this um, the absorption coefficient. Uh, we know that we need the matrix element and we need to multiply the matrix element with the a joint density of states. So we should be able to apply this. Um, and the example that is in the book by you and Cardona is uh, for indium arsenide at room temperature. And I will explain in a minute why we use that. Um, so for photon energies that are larger than the band gap, the absorption coefficient should be equal to a square root of the photon energy minus the band gap. So this expression is from Fox. Of course, we would like to know this a little bit more precisely. We don't want to know. Um, some people only measure absorption coefficients in arbitrary units. So you have a sample with an unknown thickness, and then you do your transmission experiment. And because you do not know the uh, thickness of your sample, you only get the absorption coefficient with arbitrary units. Uh, but 
if we do more precise experiments, for example, if we make an effort to uh, get the thickness of our sample very accurately, or if we use spectroscopic ellipsometry, there are ways how we can measure the absorption coefficients in actual units rather than arbitrary units. So therefore, this proportional sign here is not uh, attractive. So um, in you and Cardona's book, uh, you find an expression, an exact expression, for the imaginary parts of the dielectric function, which is just another way of expressing the absorption coefficient. And um, as expected, we have this square root term, which is the same as that we already knew. And x is the ratio of the um, photon energy divided by the band gap. But then there's also this 1 over x squared term. So there's this 1 over the square of the photon energy. Uh, that is another important factor, which is often ignored. And then we have this constant A, and this constant A, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, physical constants here. We have the uh, optical mass to the power of 3 halves. But the most important part here is this uh, EP, this is the moment, this is the k dot p matrix element, uh, which we know from the effective masses. So it should be possible to uh, measure this, uh, to describe the absorption coefficient uh, very accurately using all these matrix elements. So how well does this work in practice? And the answer is usually it does not work at all, unfortunately. Uh, and the reason is that when we talked about electron hole pairs, when we talked about electron hole pairs, then uh, this electron gets moved from the ground state into the excited state, so we're leaving a hole behind. And this hole carries a positive charge, and this electron has a negative charge, so I have this positively charged quasi-particle and the negatively charged particle. And these two will be attracted by a Coulomb force. And uh, this type of a quantity is called an exciton. And um, the mistake that we're making in this calculation is that we're only treating the electron as one particle and we're ignoring the other particle. And once we do these uh, corrections, then uh, there will be uh, excitonic effects. So at low temperatures and at large band gaps, we need to use excitonic corrections. And therefore, we use this indium arsenide as an example, because indium arsenide has a band gap of approximately maybe 0 0.4 electron volts. And uh, we also do this at room temperature. And then we do a tau plot. So um, I talked about Jan Tautz in the uh, first lecture. Uh, he is one of the pioneers in the optical uh, spectroscopy of solids. And what is meant by a Tautz plot? Uh, we are plotting the absorption coefficient to some power. In this case, we're plotting the absorption coefficient squared versus the photon energy. And we're hoping that if we do this plot and if we choose the right exponent, then we will get a um, straight line. And in this case, you see that for indium arsenide, uh, indeed, we get a straight line if we plot alpha squared versus photon energy. And then we extrapolate this down to zero. And you see the band gap of indium arsenide at room temperature is somewhere around 0 0.35 dBs. And um, people use this method a lot, and uh, it's usually terrible, because you never get a straight line like this. So usually, you know, it, you know, you have a curvature like this, and you have a curvature like that, and then the question is, um, which part of the data do you pick for a linear? So, you know, anyone who's tried that, you know, we hate doing this, right? 
but well, there are apparently examples where it works, but most of the time it doesn't work because we we made we made three assumptions here. We ignored the excitonic effects. We assumed that the bands are parabolic, and we assumed that the matrix element is constant. So we made these three assumptions, and if these three assumptions just happen to be true, like for India Marcin at room temperature, then this method actually works, but most of the time it doesn't work. And um, my friend Harlan Tompkins, with whom I worked at Motorola, who has written a number of books on the subject, especially for the beginners, he says, well, if somebody asks me to extract a uh, band gap, what I do is I give them the raw data and then they can draw their own straight line and then you know they have they take responsibility for uh, picking the band gap. Um, here are a few other examples where it actually works. Uh, another one here is lead sulfide, uh, where you plot the square of the absorption coefficient uh, versus photon energy. So also here the band gap is around 0 0.4 electron volts, and then. Uh, with this expression for the imaginary part, uh, we can also calculate the real part using Kramers-Kronig uh, transformations. And since it works for the imaginary part, it also works for the real part. And it actually works both at 77 Kelvin and at uh, elevated temperatures. So this is that sulfide. Uh, now here, uh, for indium antimonide, obviously it does not work. <coughs> Um, the, the solid line gives us the curve if we assume that we have a constant, if we use per yes, if we assume that we have constant matrix elements, then we're getting the solid line. And, you know, it, it, it works in this range, but it does not work very well at higher energies. On the other hand, if we take into account corrections for the uh, k-dependence of the matrix element, then um, we get uh, this curve here. And so we include the uh, k-dependent matrix elements, and then it works better. And again, indium antimonide is another example of a semiconductor with a very small band gap, and that's why it works, because the excitonic corrections are rather small. And at this point, um, before I, uh, so I should probably go to my uh, summary slide, and then you will see what we did today and what we did not do today. So today, we applied our knowledge of the band structure to calculate uh, transition rates using Fermi's golden rule. We took a detour to uh, introduce the Einstein coefficients because it's one of these Einstein coefficients that we uh, calculate with Fermi's golden rule. And from Fermi's golden rule, we introduced the joint density of states and the optical mass. And we looked at some examples for indium arsenide, lead sulfide, and indium antimonide. And then what we will do in the next lecture is that we will move from direct transitions to indirect transitions. I will show you some experimental techniques to measure absorption coefficients. And uh, direct and indirect gaps, people usually refer to these as the lowest gaps in a material. But if we measure the absorption coefficient over a very broad spectral range, or if we measure uh, vacuum ultraviolet reflectance at up to energies of 10 or 20 electron volts. So there are experimental techniques where we can go far beyond the um, lowest gap. So there we will find additional peaks in the dielectric function or in the reflectance. And these are called critical points, which are related to Van Hove singularities. And we will discuss in the next lecture where these uh, critical points come from and how we can uh, fit these with analytical line shapes that use savitsky golai derivatives. And um, we will also talk about uh, more uh, 
since obviously a simple, since obviously a simple uh, square root-like model does not work for indium and timonite, how can we generalize these uh, critical point models? How can we uh, introduce uh, techniques which, uh, there's a new model which is called the parametric oscillator model where we can actually describe the, uh, the uh, experimentally measured absorption coefficients. So thank you very much. Um, we will continue in three weeks. Thank you. Let's start here. Yeah. Sometimes I think it can be interesting also to, to evaluate the optical properties of metals irradiated by lasers and, um, and see how uh, laser light or light could influence uh, transition between different bands of polyphonal metals deep band transition. To, uh, so uh, this method has been used and can be used to describe the optical properties of metals. Uh, when we uh, look at the optical properties of metals, we need to distinguish between the free carrier absorption, which comes from the Bruder model, and the interband transitions that occur in metals. So um, this matrix element only describes interband transitions in metals. So if you have a, which is the, yeah, that, that's the equation. So if you have the band structure of a metal, which you've calculated, then you know the energies and you know the wave functions from your theory. And then you can do this integration for your metal and you will get the interband contribution to the optical conductivity of the metal but you need to add the Drew de Sommerfeld term by hand to describe the optical conductivity that comes from the free electrons. And um, I have seen a very nice Russian paper, I believe on zinc, which came out within the last couple of years. Uh, if you look at the older literature, then you find examples where this has been applied to uh, Aluminum, nickel, uh, Henry Ehrenreich in the 1950s did a lot of work. Uh, there are other papers. Um, um, if you send me an email, then I can send you a poster about a conference uh, that we are, about a conference paper that we're giving. So um, next week there will be the ellipsometry conference in Barcelona, and we have a uh, paper on, we have a poster on the optical properties of nickel. So the answer is yes, this can be used, but um, in a metal you would not make some of the assumptions that we would make for gallium arsenide because there is no band cap. But in principle this formalism works just as well, it's just that we have to take into account, uh, we have to drop some assumptions and we have to add the beauty term. Yeah, does that help? You had a question here? Yes. Uh, what uh, Heisenberg representation have you used in a, uh, in a product that you mentioned in a calculation of family's golden rule? Because uh, cat f is a uh, vector uh, belonging to the red space. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, cat, cat i is vector belonging to the red space, and cat f is a uh, uh, vector belonging to dual red space. But if you uh, want to calculate some, some integral, then you should uh, take into account some representation, either momentum representation or coordinate representation. And uh, uh, according to my opinion, uh, it is not, uh, um, it is not uh, uh, clear that, uh, that uh, the calculation of this integral in, in coordinate representation and in 
in the uh, moment representation will be the same when we uh, take into account the Heisenberg relation of the unsettings. Is your understanding? Uh, the, I think that the, so the question is whether we should evaluate this integral in momentum representation or in real space representation. Yes. So I think that this integral would be, at least in the, in, in the, in the atom, would be uh, evaluated in uh, real space representation. And um, how it is done in the solid, uh, I think it can be done both ways. You just have to be careful with how you do it. And I uh, did not want to bore you with all the uh, mathematical details. You know, the board is a little bit small here, so I did not want to write everything down. But if you go into the uh, references that I cited, then you can look at the math. Uh, but. Uh, I, I don't see that as a problem, which, which of these representations you choose. And you see here that we, uh, when we talk about the matrix element is evaluated in a real space representation, but then we use the, we take that matrix element out and then we have to uh, integrate over all initial and final states. And that integral, you're right, that integral is taken over the momentum space. But at this point, we've already eliminated the matrix element and taken it out. So we can choose whatever uh, representation we want here as long as we are uh, consistent. And since the matrix element is constant, we, it doesn't matter how that matrix element was captured. Uh, are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much. And uh...